Well, thank you very much, Brad, and good afternoon. Well, one of the least uh, appreciated emigration pr uh, parties of 1845 was the very last one to leave Missouri for California that year. Uh, is this a little better? Okay, sorry about that. Well, this party led by Lansford Hastings was very unusual in many ways, as you'll see. Today we can reconstruct this trip from scattered information from many sources, including some recollections by two members of his party, uh, Napoleon Smith and William Mendenhall. And then we can see how these experiences might fit into Hastings' early thoughts on a shortcut around the Great Salt Lake. Now, Hastings had previously led a group of about 110 emigrants to o Oregon in 1842 and guided about half of them south to California the following spring. On returning home to Ohio via Mexico in 1844, he set to work writing his well-known Emigrant's Guide to California and Oregon. The book was published in mid-April in Cincinnati. It presented California as an idyllic destination occupied by a lazy Mexican population soon to be displaced by a republic controlled by industrious Americans. Now, while Hastings was in Ohio in the spring of 1845, he met Samuel Brannan, who was visiting from New York. Brannan and his friend William Smith, Joseph Smith's sole surviving brother, were the two most prominent Mormons in the eastern United States. Brannan and Smith were the publishers of an influential Mormon newspaper in New York. And Brannan was on his way to Nauvoo, Illinois to meet Brigham Young. During this meeting with Brigham Young, Brannan discussed Hastings' latest plan, which was to pilot a large party to California that year. Meanwhile, Hastings had traveled north from Cincinnati to St. Joseph's in Michigan, where he recruited the first five men for his next overland trip. They would meet him in Missouri in July. Now he hurried east to New York, where he arrived before the end of May and was publicizing Oregon, California, and his book to whoever might be interested. Brannan returned to New York the next month, and at once articles appeared in his newspaper describing the Far West with advice on getting to California. He included lengthy excerpts from Hastings' new Emigrants' Guide. As July began, Hastings was still publicizing his book in New York City. Addressing a large Mormon assembly, he presented his plans to lead a substantial party to California that summer. Hastings may have wished to coordinate an overland migration of Mormons with an ocean-bound group led by Brannan, but Brannan and his party would not depart New York by ship for San Francisco until February of the next year. Now sometime before mid-July, Hastings finally decided that he had better leave soon for Missouri if he was going to make that overland trip in 1845. Uh, by July the 25th, he had arrived in St. Louis and addressed the public meeting at a courthouse, at the courthouse. He was described as an elegantly dressed, tall, fine-looking man with fine brown hair and beard. A local paper related, as we are informed, an expedition will leave Independence about the 10th of the next month for the far west. We should judge that it was somewhat too late in the season to start out on such a journey, as it will be winter ere the points of destination be reached, thus subjecting the emigrants to unnecessary exposure and hardship. The first or the middle of May is the time that is safest for these expeditions to those remote parts. And indeed, Hastings had written the same thing in his newly published Emigrant's Guide. But he was a persuasive speaker who knew how to excite his audience. He informed them that 
Uh, he urged immigration as a means of extending civil and religious liberty. Such words would have greatly resonated with his willing recruits. Missouri in 1845 was raging with the ideas of manifest destiny and what they called California fever. Hastings wanted to arrive in California before the anticipated enormous Mormon emigration that he still predicted so he could provide them with a planet town site and benefit financially as their agent in what would surely soon become an independent republic. He had already written letters to John Sutter and John Marsh in California, and then, who then relayed the information to Thomas Larkin, the American consul in California. Marsh wrote, it is highly probable, almost certain, that he is now on his way to this place with a numerous company of immigrants. It is said 2,000, principally families from Ohio and Kentucky, mostly of good character and some property. In early August, Hastings and several other enthusiastic immigrants bound for California made their separate ways by steamboat from St. Louis to Independence, Missouri. A local newspaper related they re reported the progress of their preparations. We understand that Mr. Hastings is now in our town on his way with a company to California. He expects to complete the trip in 70 or 80 days. The outfit for each man is no more than can be conveniently taken on pack animals as he is determined not to be burdened with many, if any, wagons. His camp is in the neighborhood of Fitzhugh's sawmill on the Santa Fe Road. But by the middle of August, he had attracted fewer than two dozen interested men. Hastings' party finally left Independence on Sunday, August the 17th. The very late uh, departure date again attracted the attention of the newspapers. They wrote, the season of the year for such a jaunt is unusually late. They seem to think not and appear determined to show the world that nothing need prove an obstacle. In fact, only 13 men left camp that morning. They were free of ox-drawn wagons, which would have greatly slowed their progress and which they knew would be a risky trip. On the trail, mules could make more than twice the daily distance of the slow plodding oxen, and Hastings predicted he could save 40 to 50 days for this reason alone. Packed into one of the bags were several copies of his new emigrant's guide. These books would soon be in the hands of the settled pioneers, and their comments would not be very kind to the author. The eager party first headed west through the vast green prairie for 100 miles. They now had to cross the Kansas River, which was unusually swollen due to recent heavy rains to the west. Having no materials to build a raft, they had the choice of swimming across or waiting for the waters to recede. Two men decided they had had enough at this point and headed back to Independence. The remaining 11 dove into the muddy waters with their animals and made it safely to the North Shore. About three days later, on August the 24th, they encountered a party of seven men returning from California. And by coincidence, among this group were Overton Johnson and William Winter, who, in contrast to Hastings, were about to write one of the most useful of the early immigration guides to the West. Hastings' party continued northwest along the meandering trail towards the Blue River, which they forded into Pawnee territory. Then they followed its small tributary the Little Blue, and finally arrived at the Platte River. A few days farther along the Platte, and now living mostly on buffalo meat, they encountered a number of trappers from Fort Laramie heading back to Missouri. Yet another member of Hastings' party abandoned the expedition and joined the group returning east. Now there were only 10 members in the Hastings' party, but any thought of further desertion was soon eliminated on encountering a famished and almost naked man. He had abandoned an earlier exp 
emigration party at Fort Laramie and with two other discouraged men. He was the sole survivor of a confrontation with Indians who had stolen their horses and their rifles. After supplying this unfortunate person with provisions, Hastings men tried in vain to convince him to join them and head west once more. Hastings party now continued along the North Platte River for another 100 miles. It was probably on September the 8th that the welcome site of Fort Laramie came into view. The impressive whitewashed walls rose from a bank on Laramie Creek. The party had averaged close to 30 miles per day since they left Independence. This rapid pace was made possible because they were unencumbered with oxen and wagons. And as predicted, it had reduced the usual travel time by half. Upon entering Fort Laramie, they heard anxious talk <clears throat> that the Sioux and the Cheyenne had entered the Shoshone territory near South Pass to the west and vowed to kill every Shoshone and every American they encountered. The aggressing tribes were not expected to return to their homelands for several more weeks. As a consequence, Hastings party decided to remain in the security of the fort while the Indian war played out to the West. This delay would also allow the recovery of several members who had recently become feverous. Also detained at Fort Laramie by the Indian threat was Jim Bridger, the famous mountain man who had arrived from the West on September the 2nd with two of his trappers and a large cargo of beaver pelts, deer skins, mules, horses, and abalone shells. He had just returned from a year long expedition to the mouth of the Colorado River on the Pacific. He assured Hastings party that he could lead them by a safe but circuitous route to his own trading post in Shoshone country near the Green River 400 miles farther west. He knew this entire area intimately from years of trapping. Hastings needed no convincing to accept Bridger's proposal because he had narrowly escaped for his life after being briefly captured by the Sioux at Independence Rock in 1842. So after 10 days, around September the 17th, Jim Bridger, his two trappers, and Hastings' party set out from the safety of Fort Laramie. It is likely that the route that Bridger chose initially followed the Oregon Trail west along the south shore of the North Platte for another 130 miles. At that location were the Red Buttes and a well-used ford to the north side of the uh, river. But now instead of continuing west along the north shore of the North Platte and an almost imperceptible ascent to the Continental Divide by a windswept open plains of the South Pass, they probably headed northwest along Casper Creek, most likely following what many years later would become known as the southern portion of the Bridger Trail, they continued northwest over rolling hills to the Bighorn River and its tributary, the Wind River. The Wind River ascended peacefully through a wide valley. Then following a small tributary to the west, they would travel farther north and to a higher elevation than any other part of the journey as they traversed the Wind River Mountains. As recounted by Napoleon Smith on this trip, quote, sometimes climbing precipitous mountains, then down, down to a wild chasm, then assisting their animals with ropes over a precipice, they would find themselves in a canyon where sunlight never penetrated, but on and on they went. Although it seems to have been overlooked in the literature, the evidence strongly suggested that cross, they crossed the Continental Divide at the 9,200 foot elevation of Union Pass, which makes this immigration route unique. This pass had been well known to Bridger for over 20 years. He would not see it again for another 15 years when he specifically recalled the year of this visit in 1845. On descending the west side of the Wind River Mountains, 
The emigrants were now 100 miles north of South Pass at the headwaters of the Green River in the safety of Shoshone territory. They followed the Clear River southward into a welcoming smooth terrain. 20 days after Fort Laramie uh, was left, Jim Bridger led the exhausted men into his trading post. Their detour had doubled the usual time for this passage and it was now early October. Although Fort Bridger was an important center for the fur trade in the Green River region, this shelter built only three years previously was little more than a horse corral and a log cabin in 1845. During the two days the Hastings party stayed here, they recovered their strength and discussed the trail ahead. Bridger's advice is unrecorded. He may have urged them to spend the winter at his fort, but Hastings wished to arrive in California as soon as possible. Also unrecorded is whether Hastings made any attempt to convince the other two, the others, uh, that to try the untested and what he called the most direct route for the California immigrants, which he had mentioned in his guide. This proposed route began at Fort Bridger and continued southwest around the south shore of the Great Salt Lake and on through arid terrain in Nevada. To Hastings at this time, the most direct course was no more than an arbitrary line on a map. Hastings may have been aware that Jedediah Smith had traveled by such a route in 1827. Unknown to Hastings, important notes on such a route were being carried west by Fremont and Carson, who had just taken it a few weeks earlier. But as he sat in Fort Bridger in October of 1845, Hastings may not have wanted to experiment on a new trail so late in the season and without a guide. And he probably knew there would be ample supplies and a line of credit he could depend upon at Fort Hall if he stayed on the established route. He was also aware that by traveling to Fort Hall, he would have the option to proceed to Oregon and overwinter there before continuing to California as he had done in 1842. Therefore, Hastings and the nine others rode north along the Bear River to the meadows of Soda Springs and then cross country to Fort Hall. Since Fort Bridger had been ill-equipped to provide sufficient supplies, they suffered considerably from hunger as their provisions ran unexpectedly low on the 150 mile trek to Fort Hall. Now Fort Hall, was almost as large as Fort Laramie. It was painted a brilliant white and surrounded by numerous lodges and tents of Indians and fur traders. While there, they purchased rice, sugar, and coffee on credit, and possibly exchanged their pack animals. Now, John Sutter in California indicated he had sent guides to Fort Hall, probably Caleb Greenwood and his sons to meet the Hastings party. But since it was so late in the year, Greenwood had already left Fort Hall two months earlier, guiding a large group with many wagons onto California. So after a few days rest, Hastings party followed the well-traveled trail west for another 45 miles to the junction of the Oregon Trail and the California Trail. Then they followed the wagon tracks made in the summer leading south. They gambled on the weather remaining good. All the other 250 California bound overland immigrants of 1845 had already arrived safely at their destination by this time. But Hastings still had 700 miles to travel and it was mid October. Following the California trail, the small pack train continued southwest 200 miles descending into the valley of the Cumboldt River, then known as Mary's River. This wide valley was the lifeline of the California Trail, extending for another 250 miles in a westerly direction through what was otherwise a very dry environment. For much of this route, they were following a portion of Fremont's party, 
led by the well-known guy, Joseph Walker, who could not have been more than two or three weeks travel ahead. By the time Hastings got to the sink of the Humboldt River, the men were placed on rations because the food they had estimated would be sufficient to last them into California was running dangerously short once again. Then during a moment of inattention as they were entering the 40 mile desert, one of their horses was stolen by Indians. Hastings and Mendenhall raced in pursuit, confident that the pair would soon catch up. The remaining eight men continued west into the desert, well into the night. They had barely begun to make camp when breezes from the west carried the almost undetectable scent of fresh water to the untethered animals. The horses and mules stampeded into the darkness. Smith and the others ran in pursuit, leaving their unpacked belongings behind. And it was to this abandoned campsite that Hastings and Mendenhall returned the following day with the recovered horse. It must, suggest, it must have suggested a catastrophe, but in the distance they could have witnessed an unbroken green line. These were the cottonwoods, the first sizable trees they had witnessed in over 450 miles and a welcome indicator of abundant water just ahead. The party was soon reunited on the banks of the Truckee River. Still unconcerned about the lateness of the season, Hastings party remained on the banks of the river in mid-November for three or four days to recover their strength and to fish and to explore. When the time came to break camp, the party soon discovered that following the Truckee River was no easy matter. Countless times the trail crossed the boulder strewn water flowing briskly and hemmed in at times between high barren mountains. After 20 miles, they entered the large fertile Truckee Meadows and finally arrived at the eastern end of Donner Lake, still known as Truckee Lake in 1845. Near the lake stood the abandoned cabin built by Moses Schellenberger, who one year before had been too weak to continue through deep snows. One year after Hastings' trip, the cabin would be occupied again, this time by the Breen family of the ill-fated Donner Party in even deeper snow. It was near this hut now that Hastings and his men reflected on an increasingly serious problem which had nothing to do with the steep climb ahead or the snow that was already present in small amounts. Their progress had only averaged about 10 miles per day since leaving Fort Hall, mostly due to sickness and hunger. As Napoleon Smith explained, for the previous 14 days, they had been on very short rations and it was determined that the flour, and that was about all they had left to sustain life, should be given to four men who would travel as best they could. These four would bring the pack animals and included two who were quite sick. The remaining six men would proceed in advance and rely entirely on foraging and finding game. This, these six hunters included Hastings, Semple, Smith, and three others. No game could be found in the vicinity, but fate smiled at them. Significant snows were very late in arriving this year. They began this five mile ascent up a series of cliffs and granite boulders and must have felt great relief that they had no wagons to slow them down. The ascent was accomplished within a single day. According to Robert Semple, it was December the 18th when the party of six men made it to the summit. They were welcomed by Lake Mary, a small body of water commonly used as a resting place. Exactly two weeks earlier, Fremont had stopped here, recorded an afternoon temperature of 46 degrees and an altitude of 7,200 feet. Hunger was more than ever a factor for Hastings and his men now. For two days, they had traveled with nothing to eat. So it was decided to spread apart and, and devote a day to hunting. Smith was the only successful hunter. He slew a, what he called a noble buck, uh, 
which was eagerly devoured by the famished men. They left a portion of the deer in a cold stream for the falling four men to find. The next morning, they began a gradual descent through a meadow that deteriorated into a more treacherous trail as it twisted between huge rocks, snaked up and down steep hills, and descended into the narrow boulder-strewn valley of the westward flowing Yuba River. They finally emerged from the mountains into the fertile and warmer foothills of the Bear Roof Valley. Hastings' party of six were once again famished when they reached Johnson's Ranch on the evening of December the 21st. The main building was a small half log, half adobe house surrounded by a few large trees with fields of cattle. Johnson himself was visiting Sutter's Fort at this time, but his Indian workers offered them food. Two men were sent back the next morning with provisions for the trailing party of four who were still descending the foothills and close to starvation not having found the remnants of the slaughtered deer in the mountains and having run out of food entirely except for a few acorns. The next evening, they were all reunited at Johnson's ranch and consumed an entire quarter of a cow. Saddling up on Christmas Eve, the party forded the Bear River, continued southwest to the Feather River and then south to the American River where they encountered the ranch of John Sinclair. This Scott had a hundred acres of wheat, herds of cattle, and a large neatly kept house, which reminded the immigrants of the farms they had left in the East. Here they sat down to eat what Mendenhall described as the first square meal they had had since leaving Missouri. The next morning on Christmas day, they crossed the American River on the final short trek to Sutter's Fort. It began raining steadily as the first downpour of the season started unseasonably late. Simultaneously, the first snowstorms covered the mountains in a heavy blanket of snow. John Sutter noted in his diary, if they had arrived one day later, they would have been cut off by the immense quantity of snow. I kept the whole party over winter, some of them I employed. Now, Fremont, accompanied by Kit Carson, about 15 others, had arrived here on December the 10th, but left again to find the race, rest of their party who were mapping more southerly routes into California before Hastings' party arrived. Then on January the 15th, Fremont returned and was greeted with a salute from Sutter's cannons. He had been unable to reconnoiter with the other portion of his men who had taken an even more southerly route into California than Fremont anticipated. But now meeting Fremont face to face for the first time, Hastings no doubt used the opportunity to compare their recent routes to California. He was well aware that for much of their time on the California trail, Fremont's men had been not too far ahead. But now for the first time, he could gain specific information on the trail south of the Great Salt Lake and west. Hastings' idea of the shortcut was still quite vague. Its advantages had not been considered important enough for him to attempt, to, to attempt it on his journey west. Fremont had actually traveled most of the route and had specific notes on the terrain and the intermediate distances. There's no reason to doubt that Fremont would have told Hastings a story similar <clears throat> to what he would very shortly tell Thomas Larkin, who would then relate this directly to James Buchanan, the Secretary of State. Uh, quote, uh, Captain Fremont passed south of Great Salt Lake having taken a route supposed to be a desert, but which made his distance to California eight or 900 miles less. He describes the new route he followed far preferable, not only on account of less distance, but it is less mountainous with good pasturage and well watered. And Fremont wrote a similar description to his wife just a few days later. Then after four days at Sutter's Fort, 
Fremont departed on January the 19th down the Sacramento River to find his missing men. Hastings was left behind with confirmation of exactly what he had hoped to hear and from the mouth of America's most respected pathfinder. This inaccurate description would dangerously mislead Hastings. He would soon travel, tell travelers that Fremont discovered this trail and found it to be an excellent one. In reality, the trail would cross <clears throat> almost 80 miles of an acrid salt plain devoid of any grass or water. Immediately following Fremont's uh, January departure from Sutter's Fort, Hastings and Bidwell started to lay out a town site they called Suttersville on an elevated location on the nearby Sacramento River. Land records indicate that Sutter had already conveyed a half square mile of land here to Hastings in December of 1845. Based, in, based on what he had heard from Hastings, Jacob Lease in Sonoma noted in a letter to Thomas Larkin, uh, quote, two ships sailed in August last for this land with all kinds of cultivating equipment and seeds. For this purpose, Captain Hastings has come ahead to make arrangements. Hastings, too, continued his stories about the thousands of Mormons and other immigrants about to arrive. So Larkin wrote the Secretary of State in April the 2nd, Hastings is laying off a town at New Helvetia for the Mormons. <clears throat> but in April, Hastings and the guide James Kleiman led a pack train from Johnson's Ranch with 24 disillusioned Eastern-bound immigrants, including women and children, and a man by the name of A.H. Crosby who had accompanied Hastings into California less than four months previously. Hastings wrote for the, f uh, for the first time, quote, I am determined to go back as far as Green River or Bridger's Fort with a view to conducting the immigrants to this country by a better and a more direct route than that usually traveled. He indicated to John Sutter that he intended to bring immigrants via the route just traveled by Fremont which he believed were 300 to 400 miles shorter than the route via Fort Hall. And after crossing the Sierra Nevada mountains, Hastings and seven others attempted to follow the trail Fremont had described. Hastings had been told there would be no portion of the trail more than 20 miles from fresh water. Believing they had lost Fremont's trail, they persevered for 30 hours without grass or water through a salt desert while heading east. Hastings finally reached uh, Sweetwater River east of South Pass and returned to South Bridger, to Fort Bridger, with the first western bound travelers of 1846 to persuade as many of them as possible to follow the cutoff. One emigrant, uh, Dr. P. Dr. Pope Long, observed, we will take a nearer route crossing the country on the south end of the Great Salt Lake. This route will cut off at least 250 miles and is the one through which Captain Fremont passed last season. It is proposed by Mr. Hastings, who has been with us for some time. He came through on horseback and reports the route perfectly practical for wagons. Likewise, William Russell noted that Hastings offered to take them by the new route he claimed had been discovered by Fremont. He told this group that the route would save them 200 miles while traveling through a fine farming country with plenty of grass for the cattle. On his way west again, Hastings was continuously scouting for this elusive trail. Now, Hastings' reputation was not significantly affected until many years later but today his name is linked forever with the Donner Party disaster that followed. Perhaps a little unfairly, since he was not only deceived by what he had been told by Fremont, but also the safe travels of over 200 emigrants, notably the Harlan and Young parties, of almost 70 wagons just ahead of the Donner Party, on the Hastings cutoff in 1846, 
shows us that this disaster could have been avoided. Now, meanwhile, Kleiman continued to Missouri with the eastern-bound pack train and safely packed away this time was a detailed letter by Robert Semple. It contained a comprehensive account of the Sacramento Valley, its resources, climate, agricultural potential, and a list of what emigrants should bring. It would be published in, the, in a St. Louis paper and reprinted in Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. Greeley praised the letter, which he wrote, quote, gives the clearest and fairest account of the peculiar advantages and disadvantages of California as a country to settle and live in that we have met with, which will benefit those intending to emigrate thither. Now, realizing the potential appeal of this letter, Hastings made sure that all future editions of his immigration guide now with a new name, and Hastings would publish five new editions of this guide between 1847 and 1857, would contain this letter as a new chapter entitled Sketch of the Country <clears throat> by the Honorable R. Semple. Now, just months after his arrival in California, Semple would become one of the leaders of the Bear Flag Revolt, a revolt Hastings had predicted, published the first newspaper in California, found the city of Benicia, and then in 1849 served as the president of the Cal California Constitutional Convention. Napoleon Smith and his brother would profitably sell goods to the gold miners in San Jose and Martinez. William Mendenhall would buy a large ranch in Alameda County, survey and sell town lots there, and found the city of Livermore. And Hastings, due principally to Brigham Young's determination not to proceed west of Great Salt Lake in 1846, Hastings could not attract the thousands of Mormons he expected would settle at Suttersville <coughs> or on another site he purchased and aid Montezuma on the lower Sacramento River. He was elected a delegate uh, from Sacramento to the California Constitutional Convention held in Monterey in the fall of 1849. He was one of the first three delegates to sign in along with his trail partner, Robert Semple, who was elected president, and John Sutter, his early host. Hastings was elected chairman of the Boundary Commission, which recommended boundaries for the new state. The, the Boundaries Committee, I should say. It was Hastings who recommended the eastern border of the state of California as we know it today, rather than a border much farther east. And one reason he gave was to allow his old friends, the Latter-day Saints, uh, a, a, to allow his old friends, the Latter-day Saints, to establish a territory of their own to the east. And after much debate, Congress would approve the Constitution and Hastings' boundaries of California, a lasting legacy of Hastings' activities in 1845 that preceded his remarkable journey to California. Well, thank you. There may be time for a few questions.